Thank you everyone for joining us. So, a couple things guys. Number one, uh, we do have a chat box. A couple of you guys have asked questions. They've been specifically to me uh, in some cases about general things, but specifically to me, feel free to, to write a question to everyone if you want. As Debbie mentioned, if we have really specific nitty gritty questions about a fact pattern, always it's better to talk on the phone. Uh, we feel the same way on radio. Sometimes people get a little too specific on the radio and we say, you know what, why don't we meet? Why don't we talk about all the details? So I know a couple of you asked questions about RMDs. Uh, that's a great phone call to Debbie uh, after the program. So we're going to talk about how Medicaid Trust works. And this is, this is the thing that I'm kind of most passionate about. It's weird. Some people are passionate about like painting or music. Apparently my passion is Medicaid Trusts, which is weird, but I'll take it. And the reason why I'm so passionate about it is because, you know, I meet with so many people who did these trusts a long time ago, and they don't know why they did it, and they don't know what it does, and in some cases, they have so underutilized it. And we talk all the time about fact patterns where someone comes into the office and they say, you know, we can't take care of mom at home anymore, and, and we didn't even know you were taking care of mom at home to begin with. But more importantly, we find out there's a lot of money that should have made it to the trust that never did, okay? And, and that becomes an issue. Uh, money grows over time, or at least it's supposed to, and unprotected money in you know, 1992 can be a whole lot of money in 2020. So we wanna make sure that you do take advantage of this thing and that you also understand why you did it to begin with. In order to talk about Medicaid trust, we do have to first get on the same page about what a trust is. And it's a contract, it's an agreement between you as the creator of the trust and whoever you happen to name as a trustee. There are different kinds of trusts out there and the two main kinds are one, a testamentary trust and the other one, an inter vivos trust. Now with testamentary trusts, they're trusts that are contained within the four corners of your last will and testament. Thus, it's called a testamentary trust. And that can be as simple as, I give everything to Harry Miller in trust until he turns the age of blank, right? I give it to my wife. If my wife predeceases, I give it to my kids, but not until 25, 30, 80, whatever I choose to make it. It could be far more complicated. It could deal with special needs, perhaps. And we want a beneficiary who has uh, certain Medicaid benefits to nonetheless still get uh, or social security disability to still get an inheritance, but not throw them off those benefits. So it could get pretty intense. And then there are living trusts or inter vivos trusts, and those take two main forms. And, and the goal of these trusts depends on whatever your plan happens to be. There are a lot of trusts out there, right? It's, it's easy for me to say, oh, there's two kinds of trusts. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that. But in general, Privacy is a goal of our clients, and we want to make sure that we don't go through probate, if nothing else. And so we like those inter vivos trusts. We like them even more when they're helping with long-term care benefits. In general, for a trust, there's someone called a grantor. That's the person who created the trust. There's a trustee, which is a person who's the signatory for the trust, for lack of a better word. And then there are beneficiaries. Who gets things from the trust when the trust ends? Now, during the trust existence, there's also an income beneficiary, someone who enjoys the fruits of that trust during the existence of the trust. But when we talk about beneficiaries, we're really talking about the people at the end of the day who are going to be getting money from that trust. Within inter vivos, I think the two big kinds of trust would be a revocable or irrevocable trust. And those words are dangerous, revocable or irrevocable. We're going to talk about what exactly those mean. But in a revocable trust, you, the creator of the trust, by yourself, that's the key, you by yourself can decide to undo the trust. You could say, enough of this, I don't like it anymore, and you could undo it. That's what makes it truly revocable. But in that kind of trust, typically our client, who is the creator, will also be the trustee. That doesn't mean they don't have a backup trustee, a successor trustee, just in case they're incapacitated or they pass away, because the trust actually continues after the death of the client. That's the mechanism for how we get things to our beneficiaries. The trust does avoid probate, which is important for a number of reasons. Number one, although we like our clients, we love them in fact, 
we don't need any more of your money. We don't want to go through probate. It's not a very fun process, but it's a long process. And unfortunately, it's required if we don't plan ahead of time. New York State also likes your money. And so they charge you $1,250 as an example, just to get in the door to try to probate a will. And so in general, again, we like trusts and revocable trusts serve a purpose, mainly to avoid probate and help in that way. Revocable trusts though, do not protect assets, okay? They're limited because the control you have, that ability to re revoke by yourself that's a little too straightforward, right? It, it's the control you have is a blatant form of control. And that's a problem when it comes to Medicaid qualification. Remember what Medicaid cares about, okay? When we apply for Medicaid, when Mike or Jessica or Karen uh, apply for Medicaid services, for home care, for nursing home care, whatever, what we're showing to Medicaid, to the Department of Social Services, what assets does mom or dad have where with just their signature, they could theoretically turn that thing into money. They could access that money. So you, you see bank accounts and CDs, savings bonds, cash value of life insurance. Your, your house, in the, in the wrong fact pattern, your house is absolutely a resource because you could theoretically sign your name on a deed to sell the house and turn it into money and then use that money for your care. And so when we have a revocable trust where you by yourself can get rid of the whole thing, Medicaid says, well, if you can do it, well then do it and take that money and pay for your nursing home and call us when you're out of money. So revocable trust, great for avoiding probate, but that's kind of as far as it goes, maybe some, some more in depth complicated family tree circumstances also. But it's not gonna be a form of protecting our assets for our long-term care needs. And that's where our irrevocable Medicaid trusts come into play. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit, okay? Um, I know many of you do have this trust. I know many of you don't, and you've thought about it, and you decided against it once upon a time. I always feel that all roads eventually get to this form of trust, because if, if everything goes to plan, and we keep getting older every day, and eventually, like it or not, we're going to have some needs associated with that age. A couple of headlines about how the trust works, and then I'm going to dispel a couple of myths. So number one, you are not the trustee on this trust. Okay, revocable, you can be your own trustee. This Medicaid trust, no thank you. So neither you nor your spouse can be trustee. Your children can, family members, family friends, neighbors, whoever you want. Okay. Despite the fact you're not the trustee, you're not the signatory for the trust, because that's what a trustee is, you still always have the right to change who that person is. You can amend your trust, even though it's irrevocable, right? We're gonna dispel what that word means. You can amend your trust to change your benefit, your trustee, excuse me. In addition, you could amend your trust to change who gets what one day. So your trust at some point, and for those of you who have the trust, page three, article two, says, upon my death, pay some final expenses, and then everything goes as follows. And maybe it's family, maybe it's charities, maybe it's a mix of the two. You can change that. That's not locked in. You can always change your beneficiaries whenever you feel like it. It's a very simple amendment. It's not a big deal in our world, okay? You are the income beneficiary of your trust. So during your trust, when you put stocks in and bonds, you're still getting dividends, you're still getting interest. If you put rental property in your trust, you're still getting rent. Okay, it's all for your benefit, and you know what it has to be, because you know you're creating this thing to protect assets in case something happens in the future. It may not happen in the future, and if it doesn't, why the heck would you give up control of your assets now? So we tailor this specific trust. It's not like other irrevocable trusts. It's a very specific trust. We tailor it specifically to Medicaid's rules. So you by yourself can't do it, fine. We have other people as trustees, but we control them because we could always change that trustee. You have exclusive use and enjoyment of your assets. So if we put real estate into your trust, it's still kind of your house because you pay all the bills. No one lives there except for you. If you decide to sell it, it gets sold. If you decide to not sell it, it never gets sold, right? What comes with exclusive use and exclu exclusive obligation to pay for things is things like the star exemptions and obviously being 
uh, the recipient of dividends and rents and all that good stuff. You can reorganize the assets in the trust. This is another commonly uh, uh, common myth that comes our way. Well, I, I, I want to do the trust, but if I put my house in the trust, well, then I can't sell it. Baloney. You could rearrange the assets in your trust however you feel. You can even pull things out of the trust if we want to. Okay, It's not as straightforward as the revocable model, but absolutely you control this thing. You could pull money out. But when we think about a house, right, it's really a pile of money that looks like a house. Okay, that, that is what you put in. You put the equity that your house represents. So if you decide to sell your house and downsize, the trust is actually the one who sells the house and the proceeds from that sale go to the trust. Instead of a pile of money that, you know, 300 grand that looks like a house, now you have 300 grand. We're still protecting money. And then you know what, you gotta live somewhere. So you downsize and now you have a $200,000 house in the trust and an extra 100 grand because those were extra proceeds. Or maybe we have clients who decide they're gonna rent and they say, you know what, I'm gonna pull some money out of that trust for my rent payments and we protect everything else that's in the trust. So it's very flexible and that normally doesn't happen when we use words like irrevocable, right? Day to day you hear irrevocable, you don't think flexible, you don't think control. Heck, you don't think you can revoke it, but you can as we'll see because you can get principal from your trust. Now again, it's not you going to the bank to do it. If it was, then we wouldn't be protecting anything from Medicaid because remember Medicaid looks at what you can get with just your signature. So how does the, the trust actually work? If you know me or if you met with me, I like analogies. Some are good, some are not so good. Some crack me up, some are not funny whatsoever. Um, your trust is a box, okay? And the rules about how things go into the box and out of the box, that actually determines what type of trust you have. I love this uh, quiz that I get to give people. What word is not anywhere in your Medicaid trust? I'll give you a second. The word Medicaid is not in your Medicaid trust. And it's because it's not a Medicaid trust because we call it one. It's a Medicaid trust because of the rules. Because these rules, when you put them all together, accomplishes protecting assets when we are applying for Medicaid with DSS. Now, it's easy for me to, to talk about boxes. It makes a little more sense when I start to talk about restaurants and car washes. So your trust, your Medicaid trust, it's like owning a restaurant, okay? If I owned a restaurant and I called it Dave's, and it was some Italian eatery, um, bad time to have a restaurant, by the way. I'm the owner of the restaurant. Am I cooking the food? Am I serving the food? No. Right? Probably not. Am I even dealing with the wait staff? Am I signing every time lettuce gets delivered? Again, probably not. I'm going to hire someone called the general manager to help. And I'm going to authorize that person to sign to accomplish certain tasks for my restaurant. If you asked anyone who owns that restaurant, they would say it's me. And your trust is no different. So when people think, oh my God, an irrevocable trust, I'm going to lose control. Again, baloney because you are still the owner. In that restaurant, I can fire the general manager and replace them with whoever I want. And with your, revocable, with your irrevocable Medicaid trust, excuse me, you can do the same thing, okay? You still control everything, just like you would in that restaurant. Lastly, car washes. Why are we talking about car washes? Well, if you do go to a car wash, you'll realize there's a lot of different packages and the packages go up in price and they also go up in benefits. Right? The more you protect your car with some sort of sealer wax, the more expensive it is. And maybe that early package of the inside outside vacuuming just doesn't cut it anymore. And the name of what we do is estate planning. And when we get a little more advanced, we get into the elder law realm where we're not just getting the right things done, who gets what, when do they get it, which a will could accomplish. But we start getting into protecting the car Right, And so when we go to revocable, we're protecting things because we're avoiding probate. When we go to the Medicaid trust, we're still avoiding probate. Right, We have all those benefits of those earlier packages like you do at the car wash. Now we have more protection 
yeah, it's a little more expensive. So as you go, you know, maybe the regular car wash fits. And as you go, maybe you need a more advanced and further advanced car wash. The idea is more protection comes with those higher level packages like the Medicaid trust. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Medicaid trusts are complicated. It's easy to just leave money in your name and go to the bank whenever you need money, but that doesn't protect anything. This trust, this Medicaid trust is the only way we avoid probate, protect your assets if you need long-term care, and do those two things while you still control everything. The way you control everything is because you can amend your trust to change your beneficiaries. You can amend your trust to change your trustees. That's control. Right. If I need more than one person involved because I want to avoid, you know, my Medicaid exposure, but I always control who that person is, that's control. All right. I don't care who you are. That is control any way you look at it. Now, I convinced you to keep the trust you have, or maybe you're going to call us because you want to do a trust now. What a job I did. The whole point is to maximize the fact that you have a trust. Okay. That means a lot of different things. Sometimes it's little ways to do it. Sometimes it's really big ways to do it. Um, I like the little ways because there's there's little nooks here that we can really take advantage of, and I think that's what separates uh, the way Herzog Law Firm thinks compared to some other places. So obviously, we want you to put some things into the trust, and you're not going to put in those IRAs Debbie was talking about or those 401ks. Those will stay out, and, and maybe there's a different kind of, of outfit for that. And the reason why it stays out is, number one, you know, your uh, individual retirement account, your IRA needs to be in an individual's name, for starters. Uh, that doesn't mean there couldn't be a special kind of conduit trust, as she mentioned. But also, Medicaid doesn't care as much of, uh, about your IRAs and 401ks as you think they do, right? They look at it as a stream of income. They're focused on those required minimum distributions you're taking. So we want you to put things in. Uh, what, well, it depends. Usually we start with things like houses, those illiquid assets, because at the very least, let's avoid probate. But you may never need a nursing home, but I know we're all going to die one day. Sorry to say, I'm, well, it is cloudy. I shouldn't have said that. It's a little depressing. But the idea is that we can take care of certain guarantees in life. Avoid probate. That, that's probably going to pay for your trust, believe it or not. But we don't just put things in, like bank accounts, perhaps. Now, not your individual or your, your, you know, your personal checking account, but CDs and things like that. But we also want to point things to the trust. And that gets us to things like our wills, our pour over wills. That gets to things like life insurance. So let me give myself as an example. I have, let's say, a term life insurance policy. And that policy is going to pay half a million dollars if I die. OK. Well, if that payout comes when I turn 80, and my wife is close in range to 80, if she gets a half a million dollars at that point, that's not necessarily a great thing because that money's unprotected. It's money that's now in her pocket, right? And what is she gonna do? Maybe she'll throw that into our trust, but she'll have to wait at least five years. And because I'm you know, a long way from 80, it might be a 20 year look back period at that point. So death ends up being an opportunity to get things to the trust automatically. And if I use that life insurance example again, if I name my trust as my beneficiary and my life insurance, I'm pointing my life insurance to my trust. Upon my death, that money's like that. It's in my trust. Now, my wife, as the other grantor of the trust who survived me, she does have access to pulling that principal out. She's already the income beneficiary of that money. But if she needs a nursing home the next day after I've passed away, or you know, several months later, or a year later, three years later, that money's protected already because she had nothing to do with getting it in there. I did, right? And if Medicaid has a problem with me, well, I'm already dead, okay? So the idea is when it makes sense, point things to the trust. We do that with our wills. We do pour over wills whenever we do trust for you. If you look at your will, you'll see you don't leave everything to your wife. You leave it all to your beautiful trust, right? Because we wanted that same concept of pointing things. So I want you to look at your assets or better yet come in and we talk about it. Here's a little thing that most people don't think about. I want to know if mom and dad are still alive. We have clients who are longtime clients and they have trusts and now their kids are getting up there in age and they've done their own trust. I say, hey, you know what? 
you're going to inherit money from your mom. She can amend her trust to leave things to your trust instead of leaving it to you so it's in your hands and then you put it in your trust. Now we're waiting five years. Now we're waiting two and a half years for community Medicaid. I want you to understand how flexible your trust is. It can do anything you want it to do. It, it truly can. I mean, that's not just like lip service. Anything you want to do. You want to blow up the trust? We can blow it up. All right. You want to rearrange all the assets and, and you know, sell a bunch of investments, buy some new things? Let us know. We'll tell your trustee how to do it. What don't you put in the trust? That's one of my favorite questions because we always focus on protecting assets. Well, I want you to create a budget for yourself. I know you got income every month, right? I know you have social security. I know that some of you are still working. I know that there's RMDs. I know there's pensions out there. Create a budget, right? How much money do you want to use on a yearly basis? How many vacations when this all clears and we're allowed to go on planes again and we're allowed in Europe again? How many trips are you going to take, right? What does life cost for you? Whatever that costs for six months, for eight months, just set that aside, put in your name, don't put it in the trust, because I know you're getting income. I know that means you're probably never gonna to touch that money. And I know that it's all right if we lose some money, the goal isn't to be what we call trust poor. We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna protect every last dollar at the expense of living our lives. But I do want you to be aggressive, and, and that aggressiveness only comes with you understanding what the trust does, how it does it, really believing in it. And that's what we're here for, Jan Marie, Debbie, Harry, myself, this is what we do. And, you know, we can only help you if, if you come back in and talk. And those talks don't cost you any money. Sometimes it doesn't even, or oftentimes it doesn't even require changing your documents. It's just, you know, that, that $100,000 you had in that brokerage account outside the trust is now worth 300 grand. So it's time to do something, right? 100 grand, maybe we can get away with it in the right fact pattern. 300 grand, no way. Don't be shy about amending your trust, okay? The number one goal for us as estate planning attorneys is to plan your estate, and that only works if you tell us what you want, where you want things to go. We need to know what's going on with your kids or your grandkids. If there's special needs somewhere in the family tree, we should know about it. We just add a couple paragraphs. It's not a big deal, okay? 